find someone to give us an ad hoc event. Um, we are still working with other clubs to see if they can squeeze one in here or there. And if we find it, we'll let you know. Uh, mm -hmm. We are going to start working on 2021. We just have to nail down our dates and then make sure everyone's flexible in case we're still doing Zoom versus in person. So that's okay. it. Okay. All right, good. And um, I think, as we said last time, we, um, you know, speakers may be in person, they may be virtual, even after this is all over with COVID. So it really opens up um, the, the realm for speakers, for those who are out of the area, um, for us to possibly bring some folks in that could be anywhere in the country or in some ways even in the world. So, um, you know, if, if you have anyone in mind that may not be local, um, pass it on to Valerie and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, let's see, where am I going now? Linda. Anything, I'm Linda? You're on, you're on mute. I, I, I'm muted. I'm sorry, I was mute. Um, nothing new. Um, money hasn't changed because I, other than um, the speaker or the judge last time I haven't we haven't spent any other money and that was already accounted for so nothing's changed there um, as soon as we get um, back so that we can start actually meeting people again um, I'll start transitioning the stuff for the actual treasurer job over to um, Tom, um, but as of right now, it's really not that much to do. So it's um, just um, sending checks out. So we're probably going to start looking at putting up the um, thing to renew, to renew online Membership. for memberships. For next year but that probably won't be for another month we usually open that up at the beginning of december okay sounds good and uh, let's see i'm still going across um i think will is next on my tables. there you are will anything from um on the web no nothing nothing new on the web Nothing new. Okay. Uh, Matt, I'm saving you for last because you have a lot. Well, wait a minute. I have a lot. <laughs> you do. <laughs> I wasn't told this. Uh, you know, you know what's going on. Terry. I see Terry. Terry, you want to come off mute and let us know anything we yep. need to know? Yep. <clears throat> you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I sent out a uh, email blast. So Sunday is uh, the deadline for NJFCC. It's the nature competition. Um, no hand of man. There's four categories. I don't remember what they are, but same thing. Two photos across all categories. And I want to congratulate everybody, all 25 people who entered last time. Among the 25 people for the first time in 40 years, everybody put in two photos. So that has never happened in the history of the club. Maybe not 40 years, but um, other things to consider. The NJFCC is going to have a YouTube channel. I'll send you the link soon. You can get recordings, you can get information. 
and everybody should be uh, joining the NJFCC meetup group. That's how they tie in meetings and everything they're doing. And you do it individually, just like any other meetup meet up group. And tell That's us how you join meetup, you know, um, Just Terry. join the meetup group, go into meetup, look for NJFCC and join. Okay, so and, you can um, join meetup through NJFCC? You, well, you join, you go into oh, meetup oh, and then you join the, the NJFCC oh meetup group. Just okay, like so meetup is a website? Yeah, yeah, we'll send it out. Uh, I got it, man. I'm already no, in it. Not their website. No. NJFs are just meetup groups. I, I right. so link never, meet up if you've group. never. Um, Gary, I'll had... put a link out on our next email that okay. I can know. Okay, we'll let you know how you sign up for meetup so you can sign oh, up. I'll for... send a link out when I send out a link with the YouTube. I thought everybody liked join a lot of meetup groups and things, but I'll send a link out for meetups. And I'll send a link out for the NJFCC uh, YouTube group. Okay, sounds and, good. Um, that's about all. Okay, is Melinda on? I don't see Melinda. Okay, um, Will, maybe you know off the top of your head. I know, um, um, I think we're past the upload deadline for, are we past the upload deadline for NJFCC? Yes. No, this coming Sunday. Oh. Excuse me? This coming Sunday, I think it is, right? This coming Sunday, yeah. is it Sunday, Francisco? For NJFCC okay. Nature, it's this coming Sunday. Okay. All right. And then shortly after that, levels two, three, and four will vote on um, uh, who will, the six voters that will uh, represent our club and um, yes, that competition. NJFCC, okay. it's you put in two images and they go through regardless. If I'm PSA, sorry, Will. Are you thinking of PSA? I'm sorry, yes, PSA. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, PSA, right. Did I, I said NJFC. I'll ask if I would check the data. Okay. All right. Um, Matt, you've got two things. You've got a gallery show and you've got next year's subjects and I don't know what else to tell us about. Yeah, uh, let's see here. We have a gallery show coming up. It's not until the end of 2021. Uh, Terry was able to confirm for us that the Monroe Gallery uh, reserved us a spot. It's going to be for November and December of 2021. So you have plenty of time to get your images together. Um, you're probably going to have to put at least four, maybe five images in. This is a very big gallery. So the more participation we have, the better. Uh, the gallery holds, I think, it's still a, like a hundred images. Is this gonna work? What? Yeah, it's the uh, gallery that's in the library. It's it's beautiful. Yeah, Monroe, it's in the rotunda. Monroe Public Blue Library. We were in there about four years ago at this point, I guess. Yeah, it's a, a really, really nice space. So you can look forward to that. It's uh, obviously a year away, but you know, worth worth mentioning. And I guess the big news, Matt, for you is the the topics for next year. Yeah, we uh, the members voted, and we have the topics for next year. Um, I will show them to you, and then I will email them out to you. Uh, all. Uh, yes. So these okay, are going here to be you go. the themes. Okay. Where did all my people go? Oh, here they are. Um, these are going to be the themes for next year. We have uh, January, it's going to be photo abstract. February, it's going to be black and white only. March, the power of three. April will be Barnes. May is going to be architecture. June will be outdoor macro photography. September will be garden wildlife. October is going to be trees. And November is going to be street photography. And then December will be leaves and needles. Terrific. I'll leave that up there for a minute for everybody to 
check out. I'll also send this out in an email so everybody can uh, do it. And uh, we'll just uh, thank you very much, Will, for looking that up. We'll just let me know that the PSA upload deadline is November 1st. That's November 1st to our website. And um, that is, again, it's an open, um, open subject matter. Uh, you can upload up to six photos and then levels two through four will vote and the top six images will represent our club um, to the PSA competition. Um, January. Yeah. Um, a number of us uh, went January. recently to the Tucker Farms uh, flower farms and um, we all had a great time. I think it was a great place. It was so nice to see everybody. Um, if any of you haven't already and you have images you would like to share with um, uh, Nick, the owner, you can email them to me. I'm putting them actually on a thumb drive for him. So, um, you know, he, he, that, that's the easiest way for him to get them. And I, I am gonna, of course, make sure I tell him that if he wants to uh, use any of them for anything that he needs to get your, your permission first. So I'll kind of, um, you know, keep that, um, 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 you know, I'll, I'll keep that and I'll keep track of whose photos they are if he wants them. I don't know that he would. Uh, other than maybe Facebook book or his website, but um, we'll, we'll find out. I don't know that he needs anything, but if he does, I'm gonna make sure he gets permission from you first. Um, I'm looking at the names that we have, and I think we might have some guests. I'm not sure, let me see. Um, who's, if, if, if you're here as a guest, can you just say hi in the, in the <coughs> chat room first so I can just see your, your name and then I'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourself. Okay. Hi. Hi, I see Jean. Yes, that's me, hi. Hi, Jean, welcome. Hi. Are you from another club? You're here to hear Ray tonight? Yes, I'm from Hunterdon County Camera Club. Oh, uh, okay, <laughs> up there with Ken. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I'm hearing all of your what you're doing, which sounds fascinating. <laughs> oh, terrific. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we have to bore you guys with the uh, no. It's interesting. Portion. <laughs> and then I see e Eva. Are you a Eva? That's a name I don't yes. like. Hi, I'm from the same camera club. <laughs> okay, you from Ken. We we actually some of us joined you uh, last week when you had your your uh, program on New York City photography. Yes, it was a really it was a great one. Was were you did you participate also or? Yes, yes, yes. I was there. That was, John that was, was really as good. Well. <laughs> it was very interesting. Nice and meeting you. It was. It was a great meeting. And Lou Lou Harris and. Uh, Oh, you gotta come off mute, Lou. Click the box next to your name. There you go. Sorry about that. Welcome. Are you you from a club as well? Yes. Yeah, we're from we're from River Point. And ah, okay. we love coming to your meetings. They're 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 wonderful. Oh well, we love having you. River Point's down where Vicky lives. Vicky, by the way, couldn't be here tonight because there was some kind of a budget meeting that she uh she needed to attend. And let's see, there's more. We've got more. We've got uh, Rob Lee. That's me. Hello. Hi there. How are I'm, you? You're, what club are you from? I'm from uh, Camera Naturalist. Ah, terrific. Welcome. And, uh, and thank you very much for hosting. Oh, you're welcome. Walter Blitz, I see you. Uh, that's me. Welcome. And where are you from, Walter? Stonebridge. Ah, terrific. And Jane? Uh, I'm Wes. I'm a friend of, uh, I'm visiting. Thank you oh, for yes. You're, you're Matt's friend, right? Uh, Joe's friend. Joe and Joe's, Val. Joe's friend. Okay. All right. Welcome. They may not want to admit to it, but I, I know them. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Alan, hi. I know your name. Uh, hi. Uh, I belong to both of the Four Seasons Men Elephant Club and the Mammoth Camera Club. Terrific. Welcome. Uh, let's see. I know that person. I'm just going down the list here. There's a Norman. Who's the Norman? Norman wishes to remain anonymous. 
Uh, Dawn, hello. Hi. How are you? Where are I'm you I'm good. From? Um, actually, I live out in Warren County, um, and I heard about um, your camera club from some uh, friend that works at BMS. Ah, okay. Terrific. Well, welcome. Thank you. Glad to have you. Um, let me see. The screen just popped on, around on me the way it does. Let's see. I see a Sandra. Hello. I'm Sandra Kinderconnect, and I'm from Dallas, Texas. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Yes. So how, did I, you, how, how is it that you were joining us? On Facebook, I saw, I guess, one of my friends posted that they were interested, and I am a hobbyist uh, nature photographer, so I figured Terrific. I'd join. Terrific. That's great. Yes. Welcome. Thank um, you. Let's see. Wow, so many names. Liz? You may, you may want to Liz Roth. Liz Roth. Hi. Camera naturalist. Welcome. Welcome, Liz. Um, Matt Siegel? You can come off mute, Matt. Say hello. Hi, sorry about that, Matt. I'm uh, with a few others from Mammoth Camera Club. Okay, great. Welcome. And um, who is Eichel? Is that a last name? Eichel needs to come off mute. A lady okay. on here from Dallas Tech that she saw us on Facebook. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Um, I see a, a, nav, a Navin Bog. Did you get the Navin say hello? Nope, not yet. I see him. Nader? Hi, uh, this is Naveen. I'm from MCC. Oh, hi. How uh, are you? Thank you. I've actually been to your club once a long time ago, and then I didn't oh, have time on that day, so I didn't come back. Uh, okay. Well, welcome. And, thank uh, you. Uh, Nader Bakhtar? Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm uh, from Men Must Come Up. Okay, welcome, good to have you. And uh, Ed Brady. You want to come off mute, Ed, say hello? Well, you yeah. put in person. Yeah. Okay, Ed's not going to say hello to us, but that's fine. That's okay. Debbie, how do we get the uh, competition pictures off the screen? Matt, um, Matt, Matt, he'll, he'll, he'll be back. We're, just give yeah. us a call. Yeah, yeah the, Matt, Matt will take care of it. Yeah, don't worry about it. Did we say hi to Howard? Yes, I'm from uh, the Monmouth Camera Club and the Regency and my, at Monroe Camera Club. Way far away, Monroe. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Good. All right. Did I miss anybody else? Do you see anybody else? Or? Yeah, you missed me. It's okay. Bill. Most Who's people miss me. You, you got one more up at the top, Bill Claus from uh, Hunterdon. Okay, great. Uh, appreciate uh, the invitation. Hi, Bill. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah, it's funny. As people join and leave, the, the, the names like pop all around and I get lost. So um, if I missed you, I'm sorry. Do you see anybody else, Valerie? Anybody else want to say hi? I think okay. Bill said hi, right? Yeah, I said hello. I'm from uh, the Regency Camera Club. I'm also from the Monmouth Camera Club and the Boynton Beach, Florida Camera Club. Wow. So that's right. Phil. Just a few clubs. Yep, 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 yep. Good to see you. It's been a Good while. To be seen. Okay. All right. Um, that's all I see. Any other business that we need to review? I don't think we, I don't think so. I'm going to introduce Ray. So our speaker tonight, we're very privileged to have uh, Ray Hennessy. Uh, and he tells us that starting in 2007, he st started having a very strong interest with nature photography. And in the years since, he uh, has focused on wildlife photography and birds specifically, and it's gone from a very passionate hobby to being his career. He spends a lot of his time in natural areas searching for birds and other wildlife. Uh, he concentrates on using creative natural lighting and interesting compositions to capture unique images of common and rare wildlife. His favorite style is more scenic photo that includes some of the habitat wildlife lives in. And he also enjoys um, sharing his knowledge and experience with other photographers uh, who are eager to learn. So without further ado, uh, let's introduce Ray. We're very happy to have you. He's going to speak to us tonight about 
photographing birds creatively using silhouettes and backlighting. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Good to be here. Uh, I just want to let everybody know. Uh, so right now I'm actually uh, camping kind of in the middle of nowhere in southeastern Kentucky. And so um, if for any reason, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I have a good signal, but if for any reason things start slowing down, just let me know and I, I'm, I'll, I'll repeat if need be. Uh, but I should be good to go. Um, and let me, I'm going to stop my video and start sharing my screen. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to stop everybody else's videos and okay. everybody. So give me one second and I'll let you know. You got it. Ready. Yeah, let so me know when you're ready. I'll start sharing. Mute and video for everybody will be gone. Now you should be able to unmute yourself, Ray. Yep, stop. I'm good. One by one, I see everybody going away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a process, but we'll get them yeah. You should be able to share your screen, I believe. Okay, yep. Yeah, I'll I'll get that started. Your co host, so you can do that. Yeah, okay. Cool. Let me know if that's coming through. Uh, yep. Yeah. All right, perfect. Should be good to go. All set? Yeah, I'll keep killing people's videos, but you can go ahead. Okay, all right, sounds good. All right, guys, um, so thanks everybody for joining. And uh, as Debbie said, I'm a wildlife photographer. I've been doing it for over 15 years at this point, or about 15 years. I don't know, it's been so long, I've forgotten. Um, but what I wanna to talk to you guys tonight about is how I photograph mainly birds but all wildlife using silhouette and backlight. And so, um, you know, the first thing that is challenging with that is, you know, deciding to point your camera into the sun usually is what that means. And so, you know, when I was first taught wildlife photography, one of the first things I learned, and I'm sure many of you have learned is to keep your sun, at, keep the sun at your back, you know, and that, works well to illuminate the subject and, and show a lot of detail. Uh, but what it can do over time is maybe get a little stale, you know? And so after a while, I started looking for ways to get a little bit more creative and think a little bit differently. And one of those styles was using silhouette and backlight. And so I'm going to start with silhouettes. And, you know, just a, a quick basic overview of silhouettes for me, uh, a good silhouette of a bird, in my opinion, is one that kind of gives away or tells exactly what species or close to what species it is. And so you can see this is a shorebird here and this is a songbird singing and that sort of thing. And so, you know, when I'm silhouetting birds like the shorebird here on a jetty, um, it's important for me to really pay attention to the shape of that bird. And so I don't want it facing away from me or facing directly towards me or in this case of an osprey flying, I wouldn't want its wings folded up, you know, in an odd position because then I wouldn't be able to tell what that species is. And because it's a silhouette, it's all about the shape, you know? Uh, it's, it's definitely about the background and the colors as well, but it's really about the shape of that bird. And this is a great example right here of a marsh wren, and it's got its classic tail, you know, cocked way back up over, almost over its head there uh, while it's singing. So uh, just really seeing these shapes is uh, something I really, really pay attention to when I'm in the field. And when I'm set up to shoot a silhouette, I will sit there and watch a bird and really wait for it to give me the, just that right shape, you know, like this wading bird here um, as it's fishing in the shallow water or uh, another marsh wren in the, in the marsh, just kind of turning its head sideways and, and really showing that shape or just a wading bird, you know, um, really making sure I get a good angle on it and allow me to, to share with the viewer that this subject is something other than just a blob, <laughs> you know? Uh, and it works well with flocks too. It doesn't always have to be individual birds. You can get away with doing some flocks like this 
And here's another example even of just some American coots on the water down in Florida. And one of the other things you can definitely do is uh, get interactions and stuff like that. You know, um, in this case, I really had to pay attention and, and really watch for these birds to both turn because if I had the adult loon here looking to the side like it is, that would be great. But if this one was looking straight at me, it would just be kind of a little blob over here. So getting that head turn in towards the adult was key there. So beyond just getting the shape of the bird, one of the other things I really started doing is introducing habitat and other elements into the photo, such as these out of focus palm trees that indicate Florida which is where this Florida burrowing out was, including some additional marsh grasses to help indicate the marsh where the seaside sparrow lives. And here's another great blue heron down in Florida and really showing off this habitat on a nice foggy morning. And one of the things I haven't mentioned yet that's really important with silhouettes, silhouettes are usually created when you're pointing your subject in wildlife like this with bird photography, it's almost always into the sun, but in some cases, it can just be a brighter background. And that is the key. To make a good silhouette, your background needs to be brighter than your subject. So when I'm going to do a silhouette, that is what I'm seeking out here. So this tricolored heron flying over the sunset sky, the background is much brighter. And what I do is I expose for the background. So instead of exposing for my subject, which would wash out my background, I'm actually exposing for the background and letting my subject just go completely dark, become a shadow basically, and just be a shape. Uh, here's a great horned owl on the tundra of Alaska on a recent trip I just did. And so seeking out this really bright area in the background there of the sky. And I positioned myself just so I could get the bird right on that treetop in that bright area. Because if it was up against this darker sky here where it was cloudy, it wouldn't have stood out as well. But in any case, trying to include some of these uh, spruce trees out on the tundra really kind of helps set the habitat for where I found this bird. And here's another one from Alaska. This is a Canada Jay. And again, shooting a little wider angle this time. So this one's at 100 millimeter. And shooting wider angle allowed me to show off more of the habitat. You can see the mountain scenery back there. And uh, just kind of tell a little bit more of a story of this bird. Here is another really wide angle photo using a 35 millimeter prime lens for this. Um, I believe this was a purple sandpiper. This was on the jetty in, uh, at the Jersey Shore. And the birds in the winter there are really friendly. So I was able to get really nice and close and, and just show off a lot of this habitat. So uh, here's another one at 200 millimeter, um, allows me to show off this habitat, make my subject smaller in the frame, but still hopefully have my subject stand out and be the main part of the photo. Uh, if somebody could just really, I haven't, I haven't heard any feedback. I just want to make sure that you guys are hearing me clearly. If somebody could just let me know. That would be great. Yeah, we can hear you clearly. And if we get any questions, right, I'll ask you. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and feel free to anybody, if you have questions as we're going, just, just feel free to ask. That, that would be great. All right, so continuing on. In addition to just brighter backgrounds, one of the other things that I really started doing after a while with silhouettes was seeking out um, reflections of the sun in the water and that creates for some really colorful images and really interesting uh, silhouettes like this where you can see the sun reflecting right off the water and I got really lucky on this one with the water drop coming off the bill there and you know just shooting directly into the sun usually in early morning or late evening uh, so uh, most of these silhouettes I do are usually early morning, late evening. That, that's just kind of when they present themselves the best. That's not always the case, but that's generally when I tend to do them. And so again, you know, waiting for the subject to go right in front of the sun reflection, like this semi-palmated plover here, and then exposing really, really dark. So you can see sometimes my camera's settings are maxed out. This one was 8,000th of a second at the lowest ISO I could go of 100, and then F4 gave me the proper exposure to expose for the sun reflecting on the water there. And uh, people ask me all the time, and so I'll just kind of put this out there. When I'm shooting silhouettes on here, this is a wimbrel, and I'm shooting directly into the sun. Uh, so people ask me all the time, you know, how, does it mess up your camera? Does it hurt your eye? Well, 
generally speaking, when the sun gets this low and I can expose for it, it's usually through a lot of humidity. So if you've ever watched a sunset with your eye when the sun gets really low in the sky and you can just look over at it and it's not blinding, you don't have to squint because the power of the sun is cut down so much when it gets really low to the horizon. Same concept applies here. That being said, sometimes it is really bright out if there's no humidity and the sun's a little bit more powerful. And those times it can be a little bit more challenging. Uh, but um, so the progression I did with these, you know, pointing towards the sun like that was to then start including the sun in the frame like you see here. And here's a tricolored heron, you know, again, uh, lining myself up to actually include the sun in the background and getting that silhouette. Uh, an osprey coming in to land on its nest. Uh, another semi-palmated plover. Uh, so this was the same one as earlier, but now the sun's even lower and I'm able to include the sun in the frame. Uh, a common loon on a lake up in the northeast New England states. And so again, going a little bit wider, that shows off habitat and then including the sun really gives us a sense of where this bird is living. And yet hopefully everybody can see the loon is still the main subject of the photo. Uh, so that is also one of the challenges that is tough is still making that subject the main part of the photo and make that bird, whether they be tiny or large stand out. So pointing into the sun was really fun. And then the progression past that was trying to start to fit the birds inside the sun. And this was one of my first attempts and I came close. I managed to get the tail in the sun, but not the entire bird. And so then uh, eventually I was able to start getting it. Here's a seaside sparrow right at sunrise. One, uh, that, this was this past summer. Right. And I was able to. Question. Oh yeah, yeah, please. When you're shooting this, are you using like a neutral density filter or anything like that or just straight lines? Yep, yep, just straight lens, yeah, just cranking the setting. So usually it means, especially when I'm shooting into the sun, usually it means really low ISOs and really fast shutter speeds, as you see on most of these. You know, the shutter speeds are, are pretty high up there, but sometimes, you know, this was taken this summer, it was really humid um, and the sun had just come up and you can see uh, my settings weren't that far, you know, um, 200 ISO, 640th of a second gave me the exact exposure I needed on this one. Uh, but yeah, definitely a great question. Um, a neutral density, fil density filter probably would help, um, but I usually don't have the time to drop one in um, on my lens. I shoot a 500 millimeter F4 prime. So I think, I don't even know if they make them. I assume they do. They would be a drop-in filter. They don't go on the front of the lens. Uh, so yeah, that would be interesting. But um, I usually shoot these silhouettes and then a moment later I'm shooting something different. So uh, it would probably be kind of a pain to be popping a, a filter in and out. Um, but great question. Uh, so yeah, then I start trying to line up these birds in the sun. This was one of those where the sun was definitely brighter. And you can see I was all the way down at ISO 50, aperture F20, and my max shutter speed. And this was one where I actually had to uh, move aside, focus on the bird, and then line it up, and then just kind of squint through the lens because the sun was really bright. Um, but usually that's not the case. Usually I'm shooting something like this where I was able to just look right through the, sun, uh, the lens, no problem, and line up this uh, herring gull um, silhouetted on a perch. And, and you can see a nice little osprey hiding out back there on that perch. And a moment later, uh, I'll show you, I went and captured that osprey in that same sun. But yeah, trying to line up all these different birds, these, um, uh, here's a Florida burrowing owl. Again, really paying attention. So think about this bird. If this bird was facing me, it would just be a lump. It just has this round head. It doesn't have much of a shape, you know? So I, I specifically had to wait for this bird to turn its head sideways and then show its bill like that. So just so you could even see it was a bird and not just a, a stump or something like that sitting there. And so uh, the, all those little details become very important. And, and you'll notice the majority of these photos are all profiled. Uh, whether the entire bird is profiled, but at least the head is always profiled. And that's usually what I'm looking for when I'm trying to do this. Ray? Yes. We have a couple questions. Yeah, please ask away. What causes the halo? But it, it makes it, the sun look great, but what causes it? The halo? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Do you mean just the sun around the bird? I guess they're asking. Um, if, that, if that's the question, then it's just simply uh, the subject has to be far enough away so that they're small enough to fit inside the sun. And long telephoto lenses, um, you know, especially when you're a 500 millimeter, it makes the sun really large in the frame. And so I'm just simply lining up the physical sun with the bird. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. Okay. If not, well, they'll, they'll push back out. And are you using yeah, yeah. mirrorless or DSLR? 
Uh, these are all DSLR, so I just ordered my first mirrorless, so it's going to be interesting to see how that works. Um, I will say my, I, I did test uh, Nikon's mirrorless recently, and any time I started shooting these kinds of shots pointing into the sun, the autofocus system failed quite miserably. So I'm hoping uh, Nikon actually just today, or yesterday, I forget which, today, uh, released their uh, updated version, and I, that's what I ordered, so I'm hoping it's a little bit better. Um, but other camera manufacturers may be better with that sort of thing, so. Okay, and I'm sorry, did you say you use autofocus or manual focus? These are all autofocus, yes, yeah. Okay, yeah, and when you're back to the halo? On, autofocus is tough, yeah, back to the halo. Yeah, um, is that red ring around the sun is what they're talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's just the uh, the sun and the atmosphere. So it really depends. Uh, usually the a lot of humidity will do it. So you see it there. Uh, this is just the natural exposure for the sun. That's what it looks like in the photo. These are completely unaltered. Um, every once in a while, I'm trying to see if I have one. Uh, something like this. If I didn't get a full exposure dark enough and it was maybe a little uh, white, I like on this one, I can recall, I filled it in with just a light yellow. So it wasn't just a white ball. Uh, sometimes like this, it's just too bright uh, for me to expose for it and actually get detail in it. But when it gets this low like this, this is exactly what it looked like out of the camera. Um, and so, yeah, that's just the color of the sun, I guess in the middle, it's brighter and the edges just get a little bit darker and start to fall off red. But then you can see brighter suns like this don't show that halo at all. So okay. great question. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, continuing on. This is the last silhouette inside the sun. And then past sunset or before sunrise, something else to think about is don't stop shooting silhouettes. So this is after the sun with headset, you get some really pretty colorful skies. And uh, sometimes you can get some nice dusk blues like this with this deer. Uh, it can even be applied to macro just after sunset. I was silhouetting this butterfly up against the sky. You can still see there's some sunset colors back there. And then uh, a fox uh, up on the sand dunes down at the Jersey Shore. Again, after sunset, just taking advantage of that dusk sky. So some silhouettes can be had after the sunset. After dusk, it goes even further, right? You can start shooting against the moon. This looks like the moon. This is not the moon. Uh, one of the things I like playing with with silhouettes are um, artificial lights. So this was actually just a street light off in the distance. And I positioned this uh, common turn inside of that and made it look like the moon. Uh, here's a burrowing owl down in Florida. And this was just a light on the side of a building. Again, this is well, well after dark and uh, just certainly pushing the settings a little bit and tough to focus on. But when it can work, it looks pretty, pretty interesting. So you can do some fun stuff. All right, um, getting back to some silhouettes that are away from sunset. Uh, some things can be done in the middle of the forest. And so this is a great example I like to show because this was one of the first in the forest sun or silhouettes that I had done. And I wanna show you why, because this is the scene. This is what it looked like. So this oven bird landed on this perch here and I took this photo and quickly realized to myself, well, that's a pretty boring photo. And so I looked and noticed these bright circles, these openings in the forest. And so I went for, I believe it was this opening here. So I stepped to the left, lifted my camera up a little bit, placed the bird in the opening, dialed in negative two and a third stop of exposure compensation. So I basically told the camera, shoot this darker. And then luckily for me, the bird actually sang like this. So that's what allowed me to get that singing pose. So, uh, you know, quick thinking and um, looking for these bright openings in the forest allowed me to create a silhouette. And once I had captured this one, I then started trying to do them more and more often. And so here's an entire series of silhouettes. Here's a Louisiana water thrush in the forest, uh, another Louisiana water thrush in the forest. Uh, this one's a pine warbler singing. So I really started seeking out these silhouettes. Here's a yellow-throated warbler and some holly. Uh, but And it's simply just looking for uh, bright openings in the trees in the background and then just finding that little hole and shooting for that and exposing for that bright background makes the bird a silhouette. So uh, here's an eastern Phoebe with that same effect. Uh, some other ways are shooting on water. So shooting silhouettes against sparkling water like this can be a lot of fun to just really play with this fun bokeh. You know the, the ripples in the water made for some really interesting glittery effect in the background. Uh, here's a Dunlin in the water I just took recently. Again, the sparkling water in the background made for a really nice effect. And the silhouette gives me that nice shape of the shorebird. 
Uh, here's some, some ducks swimming in the water, some bubbles on the surface give me that sparkle, uh, black skimmer. So just finding these uh, sparkling uh, backgrounds allow me to create some really interesting um, effects in the background or foreground when I'm silhouetting these different birds. Here's a short-billed dowager, and if I zoom in here, you notice he's actually pulling a worm up out of the sand, which it was, it was pretty bright when I was shooting. I didn't even know that was happening, so I just got lucky with that. Uh, my timing is not that actually that good. <laughs> uh, some fun uh, bubbles in the background, and then shooting through some foreground grass creates this really wild pattern in the out-of-focus bubbles back there. And then something else I started playing with is completely going out of focus. So I deliberately took this photo of, uh, this is a, a crow up in Alaska, and I deliberately took it out of focus just to kind of create this interesting illusion of the shape of the bird. And so, you know, just trying to push into a little bit more artistic creative area with something like that. All right, so that's it for silhouettes. Uh, I just, I'll just pause there if there are any other questions for silhouettes before I move on to this kind of backlit and rimlet stuff. I don't have any. Matt, do you? No, nah, there's no questions right now. Okay, great. And then if you have a, a break period, we'd take a five minute break probably, but not just yet, I guess. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Um, the next section's a little bit longer, so maybe partway through that, I'll just take a break, and it'll give me a chance to warm up my hands by the fire, too. That'll be nice. <laughs> All right, yeah, that sounds good. All right, cool. Okay, so backlit, or which is also known as rim light. And so this is the same lighting scenario. So usually I do this by shooting into the sun, and the difference is instead of a lighter background, like I did with all the silhouettes that you just saw, I now seek out a mid-tone or darker background. And what that does is when the sun's behind the subject against the darker background, it illuminates this glow of light around your subject. And it also allows you to still see some detail on the subject side. And so unlike a silhouette, that's just the shape of the bird or whatever your subject may be, I now get to see some detail. And this is such a fun creative effect. Um, it took me a really long time to kind of hone these skills with the backlit and rimlet like that. Uh, but now it's one of my favorite lighting techniques to shoot. And almost, I'd say 90% of the time when given the choice to shoot uh, backlit or nice front golden light, I will always choose backlight just because I find it more dramatic and interesting. So I'll start out with some a uh, little bit brighter backlight. So this is when the sun's a little bit higher in the sky, uh, not quite that low golden sun. So it's not during the golden hour period, but it still works. And sometimes this lighting can actually be better than shooting front light if the light is harsh. Sometimes putting the sun behind your subject and finding a dark background can give you a nice dramatic photo um, and, and work to your advantage. And, and give you something good when you otherwise may not get something. So here's a net catcher with just some soft sun glowing in the background between the flowers here. Uh, a green heron, he's got a nice tadpole there and you can see the, the outline of light around the subject as well as its prey really making it glow. And again, it's all about this darker background. So you'll notice that be a trend throughout all of these. Here's a prairie warbler uh, just glowing with some, the leaves are all glowing with some early spring fresh growth there looks really nice and then you know again playing with some of these fun bokeh backgrounds where the sun's kind of filtering through the trees there works out really well or just some brighter sun on the beach you know, with this black skimmer just kind of peeking out behind the log works really well to get you that glow of light around the subject and, and make something a little bit more different here's another prairie warbler singing against a nice dark background so everything really stands out and glows and it works really nicely. And again, back to that green hair. And this time he's kind of shaking off and ruffling his feathers. And I really get to see all that. And you can even see some of his feathers just kind of floating away and water drops and stuff like that. So this lighting technique really helps to illuminate different things like that. Ray? Uh, yes. Um, quick question. Um, sure. Are you using a tripod for some of these or? I use a tripod almost never. Uh, so I love to shoot on a monopod. That's the main support that I use. Unless I am shooting something on the ground or in the water, then I'm using a ground pod or just laying the camera on the ground. Um, but for everything else, I'm almost always on a monopod. Yeah, okay. great question. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, sure thing. All right, so here we have this white ibis, and this was really bright sun. It was, it was pretty late in the morning, but again, just finding that dark background allowed me to uh, illuminate this bird. And, and I can tell you for sure that if I had shot this front lit, uh, the photo would not have been very flattering. It, it would have been uh, probably a photo I would have deleted, but you know, pointing into the sun and finding that dark background allowed me to achieve a really nice shot that I was really happy with. And then just a few more here, just uh, some generic uh, sun behind the subject, finding a mid-tone or darker background uh, works out really well. And here's another example showing off those water drops flying with a good shake. Another fun thing that happens with backlight like this against a darker background is if it's cold out and an animal breathes, you can see its breath. So we see this a lot more commonly in mammals like this with this white-tailed deer and this one, was uh, I specifically just lined myself up as soon as I saw this deer out there. I saw the breath come out of its uh, nostrils and I just I ran and, and lined up where I could to get this early, early morning sun. And you can see it, I got a beautiful glow around the entire head there, but then the way it illuminated the breath there made it, uh, you know, that extra level of special. And then this year, I actually started playing with it with songbirds. And so uh, this was one of my favorite songbird breaths, this black and white warbler singing on this lovely mossy perch. And, and me and the client I was with working with that day, uh, we set up specifically to get this, um, this rim lit glow around it. We found this little spotlight of sun coming into the forest and we sought out the nice dark background and we positioned ourselves and the bird came in and landed there and then sang for us. And it was a nice cold early spring day and uh, I was able to get the breath and I'll, I'll zoom in here and I'm not sure if you can see through zoom but it's pretty cool there's actually a rainbow of colors showing in the breath there and I thought when I saw that it was something pretty special uh, and completely unexpected I never thought I'd get rainbow in the breath of a bird uh, so that was really neat so once I got this one I started seeking out more of these so here's a few a series of there's a Louisiana water thrush and uh, a pine, um, I'm sorry a yellow warbler with the breath and so the conditions for this are bright sun coming in against a nice dark background, and then it's got to be cold enough, and, it, and more importantly, it has to be still enough. There can be no wind for this, because if there's any wind, the breath just blows away instantly and you don't see it. So uh, the conditions have to be very specific for this to work out, but uh, this one was kind of neat too. And when I shared it, a few people commented, it almost looks like the notes of the bird, you know, kind of uh, coming out, which was a, a really neat effect. And then here's a a northern perula singing with some breath and then a, a prairie warbler with just a little tiny puff of breath coming out there as he's singing but you, know, you can also see this backlit uh, against the dark background just really illuminates all these leaves and then the glow around the bird it's just such a fun dynamic lighting to play with uh, while also challenging i have a question for you ray yeah go for um, it how are you balancing the exposure on the bird with that with not blowing out the highlights are you doing that in post or? Uh, no, so it's usually while I'm shooting. And uh, if I go back through these last few here, uh, you'll see a lot of these are aperture priority and I use auto ISO. And depending on the background, so this background was a little, was pretty dark compared to the bird. So I did a little negative exposure compensation. So uh, I didn't want the camera to see all that dark in the background exposed for that. And then it would have overexposed the bird and that, that kind of glow that I was looking for. Um, here you see same thing, right? Negative one stop exposure compensation. This background, as you can see, not quite as dark. So I just left it neutral. Um, same thing here, a little bit darker. So I went two thirds under, two thirds under, not much darker there. I also have a lot of light coming off the rock there. So that kind of helped balance it out. So uh, zero exposure compensation on that one. And then this one I did shoot in full manual. So uh, this was one I dialed in, so I would guess I probably dialed in about a stop under uh, what the camera thought it should be. So I'm usually, uh, if anything, I'm neutral or under, and usually I'm going to stop at the most unless it's really, really bright. And I'll show you some examples of, of that a little bit later when you get really black backgrounds. All right, continuing on. So uh, here we go. No, that's wait, next up. Wait. Hold yep. on, hold on. One more question. Yep, yep, yep. Um, do you take bursts of shots? Oh yeah, I take I take a ridiculous amount of shots and I delete a ridiculous amount of shots. So yeah, all of these photos, um, you know, with songbird photography, I'm all, usually I don't take advantage of the full um, frame rate that my camera does. My camera I think does 11 or 12 frames a second, 
And so for songbird photography and, and the majority of my photography, honestly, I usually set my camera on the middle range of like seven to eight frames a second. It's usually more than enough for me. Um, if I'm doing action where I'm shooting, you know, birds in flight or something feeding or just any kind of, you know, intense action, then I'll crank it up and, and go with that full frame rate. But uh, for the most part with these songbirds, you know, seven to eight frames a second, but yes, um, you know, I shoot wide open almost exclusively. So you'll see my 500 millimeter is almost always at F4, which means really shallow depth of field. It also means I miss focus a lot um, because of that shallow depth of field. So, you know, on this photo, for example, it would be pretty easy for me to pick up the flower petal in front uh, and then miss focus on the bird. So I shoot a lot, I delete a lot, but then I just pick out the best. Okay. And are you going to certain areas for these birds? Um... I think you birders probably know how best to find these birds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I do not. Yeah, it, it's, it's all over the place and it is very specific depending on the species, you know, uh, the, all, a bunch of those warblers that I just went through, uh, they're so specific. They're not just, you know, go to this particular forest. They're like, go to this forest and this species hangs out in this specific kind of habitat, you know? Uh, so that's how detailed they can get with those. Shorebirds are just generally, you know, head to the Jersey Shore. Uh, but, you know, it's also not just finding them in, where they are. It's also finding them in a good place to photograph them that looks pretty. So uh, that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. And, uh, you know, that's one of the, certainly, and I'll talk about it at the end, but that's certainly one of the advantages of doing a workshop with me is I, I can do all that legwork for you and take you to the spots that are going to be a little bit more productive. But in my own personal shooting, what I do is I just go out and spend a lot of time in the field and do a lot of scouting and a lot of testing and a lot of shooting and seeing what works. So uh, okay. that's what I recommend to people. Okay. And what type of tree is this <laughs> that this bird is ah. <laughs> Yeah, this one is, um, it's just a flower, like a cherry blossom tree. Uh, it was actually in my mom's front yard. And uh, this was one and this is something fun to do in your backyard, right? So this was one I was shooting uh, photos for a bird feeder company and they send me bird feeders and I have to photograph the birds on the feeders. So I had set up this perch and I actually had a feeder hanging from this branch right here. And it was just hanging from like a string. So I was able to just remove the string and post. Um, but uh, when the bird landed up there, I was able to get a shot for myself. <laughs> um, and so uh, this, uh, any other questions before I continue? Yeah. No, they're saying, wow, this is great. Oh, okay. I have one uh, real quick, Val. You said you're shooting in uh, aperture priority. What kind of metering mode do you use in spot evaluative? Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, it's uh, evaluative or uh, matrix on Nikon. So the overall metering. Um, I find for my use, spot metering is a little too specific. So uh, for this photo, for example, if I were to have my spot meter right on the bird, great that works great but these birds move around i move around um if my if my spot floats from here to here imagine the exposure difference so if my spot happened to be right here when i took the photo i would overexpose this bird so far it would be unrecoverable and so for me uh, i also like to do really heavy offset compositions you'll see a lot uh, like this for example so if i lock focus on this and then recompose and my spot is over here now well, that's not going to help me at all. You know, my spot is going to completely screw my exposure. And so uh, I personally like the overall metering just because I find it a little bit more forgiving. That being said, uh, I tell everybody, you know, w use what works for you. I know a ton of wildlife photographers that use spot metering and love it and do well with it. And so if it works for you, stick with it. This just happens to be what works for me. All right. So um, one, more, one more came in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. that's they're, good they're, that's great i know they're active tonight um any, <laughs> any white balance mode suggestions uh, i shoot auto white balance i shoot raw files uh, the cameras are pretty good at getting white balance but i also really never like what the camera gives me so uh, more often than not i'm just manually changing my white balance uh, to suit my artistic desire and what it looks like for me and how i want it uh, that being said, it's so easy to change it in post uh, using, you know, Lightroom, Photoshop, or any raw converter that uh, to me, it's one of the settings that I would never even want to have to worry about in the field because there's, you know, it's hard enough just getting these birds in focus and in the right spot with no branches and 
good light and all this other stuff. Like if I can take one thing out of the equation and have to not have to worry about it, I certainly will. And um, so, yeah, all the white balance for me. All right. So uh, moving along here, the, these really dark backgrounds. So these usually come when the sun is brighter, higher in the sky, and a little bit more intense. So in this photo, if I'm not mistaken, was taken. Let me see if it tells me the time. Uh, I know. Hang on. That was another bad. Let's see. All right, there we go. 8.30 a.m. in April. So uh, I know basically it was probably like three hours after sunrise. I know it was pretty late because there was a large um, hedgerow behind this bird. And so anyway, I had set up to shoot against this dark green hedgerow. And it, it is dark green normally when I don't have full sun on this. So when this was all in shade, I would expose for this and have a nice green background. Well, once the sun came up over that, the sun is now nailing these branches and the bird. And so I have to darken my exposure for these flowers and the bird. And what that does is it makes for a black background. And I don't know if you can see, there's a couple little areas right here where there's just a little bit like right there and there, there's just a little bit of detail showing through. But generally speaking, uh, when the sun is this bright on this, these perches and the bird and you expose for the subject, against a really shaded background. That's all this was. It was, it was a green hedgerow in shade. It, it can go totally black. And so it's a really fun effect. So here's another example. Uh, this one I did shoot fully on manual. So if your subject's cooperative going into full manual and not having the camera pick anything and just you know guess wrong, it's a great way to do it. And I will do a little bit more of that with these extreme uh, contrasty backgrounds. So uh, you'll see I'm in manual a little bit more here because the, the background, all this black, the camera just kind of doesn't know what to do with it. And so uh, what I'm doing at this point is bright sun from behind on the subject, and I'm seeking out a real dark shaded background. In this case, it was just a jetty rock. Um, in this case, it was some a dark hedgerow back there in the grasses. If I could have gotten lower, I would have, but I already had the camera laying down the grass. So this thing was tiny, a uh, little gosling. Here is an indigo bunting taking off. Again, just some shaded trees far off in the distance in a field. And so exposing for the bird and the uh, perch here allow me to get this lovely glow around everything and then a nice black background. And so it's really cool. It's like you're shooting in a studio, but meanwhile, you're just taking advantage of, uh, you know, available light and some real dramatic shots can come out of it. And so when things get a little bit lighter in the background, you can see these aren't quite as dark, but it's still kind of that same dramatic vibe that I'm going for here. Uh, here's some common loon shaking against some dark trees in the background. You can just see there's water spraying everywhere, which is really cool. And you can really see it coming off the head there. And here's the other one. And there's actually a chick floating on the, the back of that one, which was kind of cool. Um, here's a common turn just hovering over the colony on the beach. And again, just exposing for my subject here, which is a white bird getting nailed by the sun, makes everything else go pretty dark. And so it's a great way to introduce a lot of drama into your photos is seeking out these dark shaded backgrounds. Uh, and then you can really play with some foreground bokeh too. And you can see, you know, the subject doesn't have to be gigantic in the frame to still work really well. Uh, here's a pair of redneck grebes. They were just swimming and look, you can see they're actually like calling out towards each other here and uh, this backlight exposing for them allowed everything else to go dark and then they stood out and then there's just some disturbances or bubbles on the water that kind of turned into that bokeh like that all right speaking of bokeh starting to play with that is a lot of fun so introducing foreground elements can be a lot of fun things that are glowing start to get out of focus and create some really fun patterns some grass in the foreground here again <laughs> with a nice dark background and this photo makes me laugh every time they always look so pissed off those burrowing out um and so yeah just really dark backgrounds fun glowing stuff in the foreground and background uh, can just be a lot of fun and and again you know a great example of how the subject doesn't have to be gigantic in the frame to really work and you can show off more habitat and you can see the the open marsh where the short-eared owl lives and hunts in the winter and this was a just an out of focus tree in the background the sun filtering through it made for a really fun background there and then just doing a lot of stuff on the beach here. So this is a whole series of stuff with some different owls. 
and uh, having some fun with some lens flare there, just shooting into the sun. And I'll, I'll get to a whole section on lens flare in a little bit. That's a lot of fun. Uh, here's a snowy owl on the Jersey Shore on the beach right at sunset, right before that sun touched the horizon. So uh, owls can be a fun thing like that. And most of the owls I do backlit like this tend to be ones that live on the ground or spend a lot of time on the ground. They're a lot easier to manage, like these burrowing owls and the snowy owls when they're on the on the ground. And there's another great one where, you know, just up on the perch, the, the sun coming in, the sun was coming in just from behind and on the right, just gives me that beautiful glow. Uh, just a nice manual exposure because the this bird was just hanging out there. I was able to just dial things in exactly the way I wanted and, and get the shot the way I wanted. Another really fun place to do. Yep. A quick question. Um, yeah, sure. Can you use any of these techniques with people instead of birds and animals? That's a, that's a great question. And actually, all of these techniques I learned on people before I started applying to them to birds. So. Um, uh, prior to being a full-time wildlife photographer, I was a wedding photographer and um, my ex-wife, who was my partner in the wedding photography business, had taken a class from a really well-known wedding photographer who taught her how to shoot backlight. And she taught it to me, which was this whole concept of put your subject against a dark background. And, and yeah, so I was able to use people to kind of hone the skills and, and perfect them because you know, people are a little bit more cooperative than birds. And so once I got those dialed in and was able to kind of understand the whole concept and figure it out, then I started applying it to the wildlife. So uh, you certainly can, and I would certainly recommend it. And when I was doing portrait photography, it was one of my favorite styles of light to shoot then as well. And it's fun with people because you can play with like reflectors and stuff like that, which can't really do as much of that with birds. They, they don't like you running up to them with a big gold disc, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I would try if, it, if they would allow it. <laughs> so uncooperative. Any other question? Uh, no, I don't have any other ones. Matt, do you have any? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. Okay. All right. Moving right along. I'm just going to check my headphones here and make sure we got plenty of battery left. Oh, yeah, we're doing good. Cool. All right. So, um, that was just some uh, whole section on owls. This is some stuff, uh, shooting on the beach. The, one of my favorite places to do backlight, right? Uh, wide open beaches give me really low sun. So I get like, this is the first bit of sun coming up, uh, just shining in on this least turn. And if you zoom in here, you can see he's looking down. It was actually nestling in on its egg right there. So it had a pair of eggs and the little glow on the feathers right below there made for such a dramatic shot. And so for, for these kinds of things, when I'm out in the open beach like this and the light's consistent, I, I will find myself shooting manual a lot more than the aperture priority that I do in the forest where things kind of change quickly. And yeah, I'm always just looking for, you know, putting the sun behind my subject, seeing what it can glow through. Here's some marsh grasses that I use to kind of frame the bird and they kind of make a, a really nice out of focus pattern. Some of these are in the foreground, some are in the background. Uh, you know, finding these nice dark backgrounds for this oyster catcher really makes it glow. And now when you're on the beach, it's almost always gonna be really low sun because when the sun's really high, there's just so much light going around everywhere. You're not gonna get really good backlit. Uh, so those, those kind of higher sun backlit shots kind of tend to only work when you're in the forest in my experience. Um, when I'm on the beach, I definitely like that sun to be a little bit lower. And this was a great one where the, the sand just started blowing around and all these grains of sand got lit up for this poor oyster catcher that was getting sandblasted out on the beach, uh, the little chick there. Um, and here's a nice moment between the adult and the chick where the uh, adult was actually dropping some food for the chick, which was nice. Here he's just playing with a little piece of shell, but look at this glow. I mean, it's so hard to beat. This is such a, such a unique, dramatic, style of light when you shoot into the sun. Now, if I was on the other side of this bird, it would have been gorgeous front lit golden hour, I mean, golden 15 minute sun, you know, this sun was really close to uh, setting. And it would have been a beautiful shot. But to me, when I shoot this, this is doing something different. And that's what I, I really recommend everybody try just try these different things, you know, shoot into the sun, shoot sideways to the sun, just try these things, see what works out. Uh, because, you know, everybody, there, there's countless photos of these adorable chicks just in beautiful golden light, but not as many that have this this kind of rimlet glow to them. And I like trying to, to do something a little bit different. Here's a least turned chick on the beach, 
just glowing in some sun. I found a real nice dark background on this one with a, a nice sand dune in the shade behind it. Um, there's a black skimmer <laughs> trying to hack down a fish here. He was just fed. It was a massive fish and he, that's the tail just going away and he did manage to get it. Uh, but the, the lovely glow on this bird uh, was, was really nice and a little piping plover with, with an insect and and then lastly, just a semi-palmated plover walking across the beach. And that's the other thing you get, some of the colors you get when you're shooting into the sun like that, just these beautiful oranges and pink tones and yellows. Uh, things really get really pretty when you're doing that. All right, so other birds that I love doing backlit stuff with are uh, waterfowl. So here's a common loon on the water, and a hooded merganser. I'm gonna move through these a little quicker because I know I have a lot to go through still. Um, the red. Redneck grebe. This guy was actually, he had just caught a fish and he was like shaking it violently, I think trying to kill it, I'm guessing. Uh, but he just kept hitting the fish into the water and making these huge splashes. And so I was really grateful that I was settled for backlit because if I was frontlit, you probably wouldn't see these water drops nearly as good, if at all. And right now with the backlit, it made for some beautiful uh, sparkling water drops up in the air. You know, wood duck uh, letting everybody know whose territory it is. Uh, just a nice backlit glow. All the water drops are getting splashed or, or lit up. And yeah, it works really good. This is this is a great example of uh, how backlight shows off all these water drops and, and really makes these things stand out like that. Even just some bubbles on the water just glow beautifully for this pied-built grebe floating on the water. And uh, yeah, the next thing, let me see where I'm at here. Yeah, this is probably a good time to take a break because I'm going to get into like a whole action section. So if you guys, is is now a good time to take a break or should I keep moving along? I don't know if I'm taking too long. Yeah, nope. that's, that's fine. We'll take a five minute break. Okay. Just set a little five minute timer and I'll make it so people can unmute themselves if they want to be unmuted. Yeah, I'm happy to answer anything too. Well, um, well now participants unmute yourselves. Anybody should be able to unmute yourself now. Ray, do you want to answer a question while you warm, warm up your hands by the fire? Yeah, I'm on the headphones, so I can talk. <laughs> okay. I am by the fire right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's getting chilly when I was walking, so I can appreciate the fire. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's getting down into like the 30s down here tonight, so it's going to be a cold night. Oh, my. Stay warm. <laughs> so the question is, say that the day is cloudy and overcast. Would you attempt to take any pictures using these techniques or just edit them on your PC? So um, I, the backlight thing really isn't going to work with, uh, you know, overcast days. But what can work is the silhouette thing. I have taken some silhouettes in overcast days. And what I do is, you know, I'm just looking for a brighter background. And so you can find brighter backgrounds with overcast days. Uh, the trick is if it's not bright enough. So it has to be, you know, I don't know what the, the formula is as far as how many stops brighter it has to be than your subject, but I would guess you probably need a background a good five to six stops brighter than your subject. So because if it's not bright enough in the background and you expose to the background, you're going to get some exposure on your subject and it's not going to turn into that silhouette, that shape, right? So uh, your subject needs to be dark enough and your background bright enough to get, have that difference where you can expose to the background and get the subject black or close to black. Uh, you know, I've taken some where um, it's close to a silhouette and then in post, I'll just take the black slider and darken it, just add contrast to the photo to kind of enhance that silhouette. So you can, you can turn near silhouettes into silhouettes in post. Um, but yeah, the backlit thing, I probably wouldn't even bother trying if there's no light. Okay. Um, one, one question, I'm gonna make it a question. Um, somebody, <laughs> somebody would like you to take their wildlife competition image and I'm telling them, no, you won't do that. They gotta take their own. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Listen, I suck at these competitions. I have barely won anything I've ever, ever entered. So, uh, you're better off asking other photographers who are, who are good at winning those things. <laughs> Um, and the other one, someone asked me, are you near Slade in Kentucky or Natural Bridge? Um, where am I? I am in, oh gosh, let me look. I think it's Leeburn, L-E-B-U-R-N. 
Okay. I, I have the city I'm staying in. I have no idea. I'm hoping the people who ask the question know. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know either. It's just yeah, it's like uh, I had read somewhere that I, I came down here to photograph elk um, on my way back from a uh, Florida trip, and uh, just didn't have any luck. I didn't. I wasn't able to find any, but uh, it was totally fine. It was a really nice trip down here, so I'm heading back home tomorrow. Hey Ray. Yeah. This is Linda DeAngelis. Um, Want to know, have you ever been to Benzinet, Pennsylvania to do the elk? Uh, I have not, and it's it's just a personal reason. Um, it's so well known. There's so many people there. Um, for me, it's just not my idea of fun standing there with a crowd of people photographing things. Um, I don't, you know, I don't hold anything against anybody that likes to do that or wants to do that. Uh, and I know that area is certainly famous to photograph the elk. Uh, so yeah, I came down here just to try and find kind of an out of the way place for myself. Uh, so but, there is yeah. areas in uh, central, north central Pennsylvania where you can do that with elk without the crowds. That's good to know. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to look into that myself as well. So I appreciate that info. I was also already in Florida, so it was just like, yeah, let's go try somewhere new and check out some new places I've never been. So that that was also part of this. I actually got to go camp out on Dry Tortugas. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. It's an island 70 miles off the coast of Key West. So I camped out there for a couple nights with my sister and her boyfriend. And uh, uh, just such an amazing trip. I'm, I'm actually going to be planning on trying to run a workshop there next year because the photography was just unbelievably outstanding. So that was a lot of fun. I've been there. It's beautiful. Did you stay? Did you camp or did you just do a day trip? No, we just took a catamaran out from uh, yep. Key West. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a tropical island. And the best part, like when you camp there, is, you know, all the people that come out on that boat all leave. So I think there was maybe like, I don't know, a ballpark, like 20 people on the whole island all, all night and into uh -huh. the next morning. So you feel like you have the place to yourself. It was so incredible. And the, the night sky was like some of the clearest I've ever seen. So you could see the Milky Way and we actually saw bioluminescence in the water. You'd walk in the sand and then your footsteps would be glowing after you, you picked up your foot. So it was just really, really magical trip. Yeah, I'm sure it was. It must have been beautiful. And the birds, there was warblers like just dripping off of trees. I had them, I had, literally had warblers landing on me. There was just wow. so many and they were so fr I've never seen birds like this. I've never been able to get that close to warblers ever. I've been shooting them for years. And I was photographing like headshots of warblers with a 300 millimeter on my full frame camera. Like I didn't even need a lot of focal length. It was crazy. Sure. So yeah, I'm gonna put together a workshop and take some people out there next year, hopefully. All right, I'm gonna mute uh, Lynn and a couple other people and then we'll be ready to go. All right, sounds good. Um, all right, you should be good. All right, great. So next up, action. So birds in flight is a great thing to mix in with this backlight. So, you know, same concept. I'm still looking for, um, you know, the sun hitting the subject with a darker background. And now when we add birds in flight, we get this glow through the wings. Uh, in the takeoff like this, you get the splash and the wings glowing. Uh, just a, a little bird in the field, this loggerhead strike just gets this nice glow in the wings as well as the rim light around it in the field. Uh, I really love getting these birds taking off out of water. You, know, you get the splash, the, the wing glow, just the, the orange from sunrise. It just all comes together really nicely. Uh, here's a black skimmer. And you can see all these, the splash from it is actually not from the bird. The majority of this splashing are minnows just trying to escape as it was uh, kind of tearing through the water there. So that was pretty neat to see because you can see some of these splashes are actually ahead of the bird. Um, but yeah, this backlit technique really works well uh, to, to really show off the wings. A, a northern harrier flying over the field with the grass glowing, the wings glowing so nicely. And that's the main thing I really like when shooting these birds in flight is the wings glowing and just getting those, those wings extended. Uh, it doesn't always have to be in flight, right? It can just be fishing action like this with this great egret, uh, or it can be the mating action of some black skimmers. Uh, that looks just great in backlight as well. There's another one with this, uh, this egret just doing a takeoff after it caught that fish. And uh, here's one. This is getting closer into the realm of silhouette, right? 
So, but you can still see there's just a little bit of detail in there. We're getting that lovely glow around the wings instead of just, um, if I had an all lighter background, the wings would just be all black kind of thing. So that's a big difference there. Uh, a short-eared owl flying and getting that glow in the wings. Nice, nice medium tone background. This is one of my favorites. This black skimmer just coming head on over the colony. The wing spread, he's getting lit up all nice. Got a little fish in the beak and everything. And uh, I just got really lucky with this and got some really nice symmetry on it. So, uh, but uh, really shooting against these dark backgrounds. And this is, this is one where these birds were constantly flying in the same direction. I set up in this spot to shoot into the sun against a, a, a sand dune in shade. And that's what gave me this nice uh, backlit shot. So it's, you know, planning and choosing to set yourself up just right. So when the bird does fly in the right uh, area, hopefully, uh, you get the shot, you know, and uh, full manual on these with uh, birds in flight almost always, uh, just because uh, if you're letting the camera pick, you're changing, the, you know, the bird flies in front of different backgrounds and it kind of, your exposure can bounce all over the place. So I find myself with birds in flight for backlight more often shooting full manual with that as well. Uh, all right, some, uh, some fun bokeh it is a really fun thing to play with, with these, uh, these birds in flight, or I'm sorry, um, the backlit birds. Uh, shooting them with bubbles in the water like this, um, bubbles, uh, ripples in the water behind them. You know, all these things are just little tiny disturbances in the water that create uh, this lovely sparkling effect when it's thrown out of focus with a long telephoto lens. And the best way to get this sparkling stuff on the water to get these bubbles and these disturbances lit up is to shoot backlight. So the sun is coming through all these bubbles or ripples in the water like this, and it just sparkles, it lights up, you throw it out of focus, and then boom, you got that glitter. And so it, it'd be, I think it'd be pretty hard to get any of those effects actually shooting with front light at all. So uh, backlight is one of the great ways to get this, these really fun foregrounds and backgrounds. And anything on the water like this, the key is to get the water or to get the lens as low as possible. So for all of these, my lens is hovering just, you know, inches off the water. Uh, that is the key to get all these sparkling effects. This is a river with the sun shining off of it. You know, just some ripples in the running uh, creek. And then again, just bubbles on the water and just getting that lens really, really low sun shines in and then boom you got it and and really uh shooting wide open on this so really shallow depth of the field helps to exaggerate all of these uh, as well so that's another fun thing and then sometimes just water splashes around and, and you get these these lovely sparkles here's just a few more i'll show you guys and so you know with something like this composing at the top of the frame actually allows me to include more foreground and the more foreground i get the more of these real fun sparkles and this one's kind of cool like a random rainbow on that one um, yeah, the more foreground you get, the more of those foreground sparkles you get. Wood duck on a river doing the same thing and just some rippled water out on, a, um, out on the, the marsh with the, that, that snowy egret. All right, it doesn't always have to be water either. It can be sand. So sand will do the same thing. These are all just sand particles being lit by the sun, throw them out of focus. Next thing you know, you got some nice sparkling uh, fun bokeh in the foreground and background. This is sand and shells on this beach. And early morning sun, just shining off of that, makes all these little points of light, throw them out of focus, and then you get that lovely glittery effect. Here's some more sand with this piping clover chick. Some sand with these laughing gulls. And this is some real nice crisp backlight too. Look at the rim light going around these birds. You can, you can see it's coming in a little bit from the left. And you really notice it here. See how we have the glow on this side of the bird and this side, but not so much on this side. Uh, but it still really works because it was kind of just right back in there, I think, above, it was about where the sun was, and it gives me that nice rimlet around everything. Here's some more sand that you can play with, and then just other things will do it. You know, this is a bunch of lily pads that had water drops on them that were uh, thrown out of focus and gave me that fun bokeh, or a jetty rock that had a bunch of water drops on it in the background gave me some really interesting stuff there. So just playing with, you know, anything that gives you points of light that you can throw out of focus you know you know bubbles in the background and shooting through some foreground stuff and some some foreground blur here just to make things all kinds of weird just just lots of fun creative ways to shoot backlight and you can see this stuff when you're looking through the lens so for a shot like this you know I look for this little opening and through all the foreground stuff I'm shooting and then just kind of 
move myself around and this is where the monopod comes into play or if you have a light enough setup to just do handheld that can be great as well but uh, for me being able to uh, be be portable and be able to move around to kind of manipulate what's in the background what's in the foreground uh, while I'm looking through the lens is important whereas if I was you know, kind of set down on a tripod, it would be pretty tough to do all those things or, or a lot more difficult to move around and, and be fluid in that way. Ray? Yes. Before you go on, um, yeah. actually that might be a good picture to go back to. Um, when you say throw it out of focus, do you mean you're focusing on the bird and the rest of it is softer? You got it. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the shallow depth of field, you know, focus on the subject and then the further out of focus your foreground and background are, the larger these balls of light will be. So I can show you some examples here. Um, great one. So notice these sparkles, how tiny they are as I get closer to the bird. Okay. And so I, I would have some sparkles if I was up a little bit higher, but because I got really low to the water, these sparkling bubbles down here are probably only like I don't know, a foot or two, well, probably like eight or eight or nine feet in front of the camera, whereas these are probably like 30 feet out, you know, and so having these things much closer to the camera, or if I had things a lot further away in the background, those all become bigger out of focus points of light, and so a lot more fun uh, bokeh that you get, so the, the, that's usually what I'm looking for, is trying to get things really far away and really throw those things out of focus as much as possible compared to my subject being sharp. So great question. Was that the one? Yep, that's the only one. Okay, cool. All right, excellent. Okay, nearing the end here. Thanks for hanging in there with me, everybody. Okay, so the uh, really uh, last bit of sunlight or first bit in the morning, so. Um, that's when everything really starts to glow. Uh, this is when it challenges your autofocus system because a lot of the times you do start to deal with lens flare. You're shooting almost directly into the sun, but the colors you get and the glow you get from this really early morning or really late evening backlight are just some of the best. So uh, again, I talked about it earlier being on the beach with these really early light um, scenarios. And uh, you can see how you just get such a lovely glow. The sun is just out of the frame up here. And especially these uh, baby birds with, where they have downy feathers, man, they really glow. You know, adult birds will, but just not quite the same. Uh, and then, yeah, starting to play with lens flare. And, you know, lens flare is one of those things that, you know, you almost can't tell exactly what you're going to get until you see it in the computer. Because uh, when you're shooting it, it's really hard to see. It's really hard to focus. And, you know, you can tilt your lens just a couple of degrees left or right and totally change the look of that lens flare. So... Uh, I do find it to be a lot of fun. You know, a lot of these photos end up trashing just because they're too flared and I can't even really see the subject or I missed focus because of it. But uh, these modern lenses have really good coatings on the front of them. And so they do a good job of, of managing some of that flare or at least giving you enough photo that you can edit something out of it in post-processing. You know, a lot of these backlight shots, especially like this one, they do require a lot of post-processing. So there's, you know, I do edit these you know I don't change the look of them but they do require a lot of added contrast and and like for this one I I darkened everything in this photo except for the birds just so the birds stood out a little bit more uh, that kind of thing so it does require some specific editing sometimes not always but sometimes uh, but something like this is one where you know just a ton of lens flare but you know really editing this adding a lot of contrast and it makes for a really unique photo I think this one was one that didn't need too much, but it had just that right amount of lens flare to get this orangey, almost pink glow on there from the early morning sun, which was really fun. And <laughs> this was Lee's turn with this um, chick right there. They both look pretty funny in that little uh, nest cavity there, but uh, starting to play with getting the sun in the frame too. So just like the silhouettes, right? I went to getting the reflection of the sun and then trying to put birds inside the sun. Well, same thing with backlight, not putting them in the sun, but close to it but actually starting to include the sun in the frame. And so, uh, you know, when the sun is low in the frame, lots of humidity, the power isn't that strong, I can now get an exposure on my subject and the sun exposed in the, in the frame at the same time. Uh, this is something that's just, you know, amazing with today's modern digital cameras that you can do that. You can actually expose for the subject and the actual sun.
in the frame and not overexpose the sun. What I tend to do is I expose more for the sun and underexpose my subject and then lighten my subject back up and post. So that's the approach that I usually do when including the sun in the frame. Uh, but it's a really unique thing that you can do and uh, makes for a lot of fun. You know, here's a, an osprey and you can see it's just lit up and glowing and you can see the detail in the osprey yet you still have the sun in the frame, which is really cool. There's a piping plover on the beach with the sun in the frame and uh, a common turn. And then there he is just kind of bowing to that sun. And this is when the sun was like really low power. I mean, this is just when it was touching the horizon. And that's it guys, that is the end. So any questions, I'm happy to answer. If you want me to go back to any photos, talk about anything, I'm happy to do that. But thank you all so much for listening. Um, I guess before we do all the questions, one quick thing, I, I do post new photos on my website every single day. It's rayhennessy.com. Uh, so new photos are there every single day. I have tons of videos as well. Uh, I post a, at least a video every week, sometimes showing how I edit photos. So uh, those are really fun if you watch my real-time edit videos. I have behind the scenes videos, some Q and A videos. Um, I also have a podcast that I put out sometimes weekly. <laughs> I'm not always really good with that, uh, but that's really fun. It's the wildlife photo chat podcast. And then I also do workshops. Uh, I do have um, a few all day and group workshops scheduled for coming up in 2021. Uh, but not many, but my anytime workshops are what I do most of. And those are workshops that are usually local to Southern New Jersey or Florida when I'm down there in the winter. And uh, you get to work with me private one-on-one -on -one, and they're all organized by season. So if you just go to the anytime workshop and click on the season you're interested in, you can see all the different workshops available for those. And then I also do uh, mentorships where I work with people continuing you know, on a continuing basis. And I also do uh, online workshops uh, where basically it's like remote training uh, where we use either Zoom or Skype and connect. And then I can just kind of walk you through. It's great for post-processing or just answering any questions you have or getting feedback on your photography or anything like that. So uh, definitely just check out rayhennessy.com for all that stuff. And uh, yeah, back, back to any questions if you guys have any. All right, I set it so participants can unmute yourselves and ask questions if you'd like. Excellent. I gotta say, I'm impressed this whole thing worked from out in the middle of nowhere here. <laughs> Modern technology. Right? Isn't it the best? I mean, I'm looking up at the Milky Way right now. You know, it's crazy. Don't rub it in, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm uh, freezing too, okay? So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, here's a question for you. Um, do you use HDR methods? Uh, not any that are really automatic. I mean, I guess what I do to edit some of these photos sometimes could be considered HDR in that I will, I will kind of edit them to, to show some, uh, you know, a lot more detail than it was originally there. So for example, like a photo like this, um, right out of the camera, this bird was pretty much dark, you know, uh, cause I exposed for the sun. Uh, but in post I was able to, you know, process a version for the background, the sun, and then process another version for the foreground, the bird, and kind of merge them together in Photoshop. So it's kind of like a manual HDR. Well, I don't do it often, but it does come into play with some of these heavily backlit shots like that. So yes. Okay. Great question. Um, I take no credit for any of the questions. They did come from other people. I will be honest. Yes. <laughs> But you're getting it. I'm not sure if you're in chat, but a lot of people are saying thank you. You're a great um, presentation. Beautiful yeah. pictures. Um, they're very unique. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, showing us all your beautiful work and sharing your, your techniques. Excellent, excellent work. Beautiful. Uh, another well, question you. came in, Ray. Um, do you use yeah. Nick, Nick software? I do not. No, I know a bunch of people that love them, though. You know, so yeah. And then the other one that I get a lot of uh, recently is, um, oh boy, I'm gonna forget it. It's the uh, Denoise software, Topaz, uh, Topaz Labs Denoise plugin. Um, a, a lot of people I work with have asked me about it because they use it, and so I did get that just to see how it works, and it seems to work great. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for anything that works for you, you know. Um, I 
am a person with, with like the noise, for example. Uh, I don't really mind some grain in my photo, but that being said, my camera's really good at high ISO. So, you know, there's I'll, I'll have images I shoot at 6400 ISO that I think are fine and don't need much noise reduction, whereas some other people might think like they're way too grainy and they'd want to clean it up. So uh, it's, you know, a lot of this stuff is personal preference. And if it works for you, then, then I say stick with it. And in the winter, are you on the east or west coast of Florida? Uh, so I will be on the east coast of Florida um, for all of January. And I have a bunch of stuff available then that can be scheduled. And in the end of March, beginning of April, I'll be on the west coast in Cape Coral to do the burrowing owl workshops. I, I ran a bunch of them last year. and were Really, really fun. We, we had a lot of uh, a lot of fun with the owls as well as some shorebirds and just some other you know, classic Florida birds and stuff like that. So, uh, but that's all on my website uh, under those workshops. Okay. Um, someone else says your voice is as smooth as cognac. <laughs> Listen to you all day. So a reference to the last <laughs> name there, maybe the Hennessy. <laughs> <laughs> Which I got to say, I, I don't drink at all. And I tried it once. Yeah, it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and are all your photos taken with well, a full, full frame camera? They are. Yeah, I shoot. Everything is with a D4S, a Nikon. And before that, it was a Nikon D3S. And now in the, in the well, in, well, in a couple of weeks, when I get the new uh, Nikon Z6 II, it will be that a little bit. I'm just going to mix some of that in because I don't think it's going to be my main camera quite yet, but I'm doing a lot more video and the mirrorless is amazing for that. So, uh, but yeah, I've always shot a full frame camera. Um, and again, this is a personal preference thing, right? So for me, I find myself shooting in low light more than I find myself needing to crop in close. And so the trade off of, you know, the little bit less reach that doesn't, that, or, you know, that you would get with a crop sensor camera. Um, I don't mind that because uh, I don't tend to have that much of an issue getting close to wildlife. I, I've been doing it long enough that I've kind of figured most of the birds I I shoot, I've, I've kind of figured them out and gotten pretty good at getting close. Plus, I also like shooting them small in frame too. Um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is I shoot a lot more low light and the full frame cameras tend to be better in low light. So that's my preference. But a lot of people I work with shoot crop sensors and they do well. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I say, you know, for everybody listening to, it's like always be wary of anybody that tells you like, this is the right way. This is the only way, you know, um, you know, all, all the advice I gave you today and suggestions I give. And when I teach people, it's, it's all my opinion. It's all what works for me. You know, so if you, if you like my style of photography and you want to try and head in that direction or try some of those things, then, then certainly, you know, give them a shot. But if you try some of them, some of them and they don't work for you, then stick what works with you, you know, um, you know, try it. I think it's worth trying a lot of different things, but not getting stuck just doing something because, you know, some certain photographer said that's the only way to do it or that's the best way to do it. Uh, it may be the best for them, but it may not be the best for you, uh, but it's always worth giving it a shot. All right, I guess I'll stop sharing my screen now. I don't see any other questions. Okay. Just scrolling, making sure. Um, oh, are there any <laughs> vulture, vulture photos? <laughs> vulture photos? Oh, yeah. I, of course, I just stopped sharing my screen. But yeah, I totally have photographed vultures. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> yeah, I don't pass on any bird. You know, I. that's another thing, right? That for me, I find like a good photo of either a common or you know, what many may consider like a vulture, an ugly bird. If you have a good photo of those birds versus, a, you know, a mediocre or bad photo of a great bird, uh, I always take the, the good photo of the, the bad bird. <laughs> uh, oh, I see somebody asked if I've ever used older vintage lenses, no autofocus, but great effects. Um, no, I have not. Uh, I don't think they would be great for wildlife. They'd be tough, I should say. Let me, let me rephrase that. I think they'd be tough for wildlife. Um, certainly more, it'd probably be a better fit for like portrait work or something like that, where you have a little bit more control over what's going on. 
Um, but yeah, some of those old old lenses do certainly have really interesting bokeh effects and the way the light goes through them. So that can be cool. And someone said your images were beautiful and motivating. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of those comments. So thank you, everybody. I really, really, really appreciate it. I'm glad you guys all enjoyed it. Not making sure we didn't miss anything. Matt, do you see anything uh -huh. that I may have missed? Or anything that you may have that I don't? Uh, just make sure here. Marianne asked uh, where Ray is. Where, where is he? I'm based in uh, southern New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. <laughs> Um, but I think, I think um, more and more currently, currently you're oh currently currently in uh, Kentucky yeah so um, uh, what did I say the name of the town was uh, start with an L uh, yeah it did start with an L <laughs> uh, I've forgotten already <laughs> middle of nowhere Kentucky okay <laughs> yeah is it it's south southeastern or what the... I would call it more hills yeah hills. not quite mountainous here but it's beautiful yeah it's beautiful it's a place called um uh Larry, adventure Larry. adventure mine park or something like that uh, there's a campground on that yeah, i should know all this stuff better here let me i'll look it up right now mine made paradise campground is where i'm at uh and it's in leeburn kentucky mm -hmm. l-e-b-u-r-n so yeah that's where i'm at right now mm -hmm. and this is just okay i'm unmuted hey ray so so you yeah. said you're there looking for elk um yeah but you have not found any. Have you heard them calling? You know, I thought one morning I did hear them calling, but uh, I'm pretty sure it was just some cows moving through because there's like free roaming cows here. And so I was like unsure. And then a little bit later, I saw the cows. I'm like, oh, that's probably what I heard. Um, but I was also talking to some of the locals and I think I'm a little bit late on the, the rut on these guys, which I kind of knew coming here. I was just, I guess I was uh, just making this part of a trip on the way back from Florida. This is just some, somewhere to stop and check out. I know in Pennsylvania, around Columbus Day is prime time. Yeah. Um, yeah. The rut. yeah. Yeah. So I think they rut a little bit earlier than the whitetail. So, yeah. But I, I managed to find some other stuff. I had a good session with some kill deer, and uh, there's um, eastern meadowlarks all over the place, and uh, some savannah sparrows this morning. So there's always something to find, you know. Um, yeah, you know, the other thing is it's just it's always nice to explore a new area, you know, so even when the photos don't work out, which they don't always, that's part of wildlife photography, you know, um, it doesn't always pan out to, to get some great shots and that's totally fine. So somebody just dropped the link to the park in here. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Guys are quick. That, that'd be I'll be out that way next week. I'll tell you, if you have, yeah, if you have a, if you're like an ATV rider, this would be the place to go. There's like hundreds and hundreds of miles. Like that's mainly what this park is. It's everybody comes here and, and rides their uh, their four wheelers and their ATVs around. Uh, I don't have one, but um, if you're into that, man, this seems like an amazing place to do that, and it's just beautiful to ride around. So, yeah, I'm like, ooh, take my Jeep out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. It'd be fun for that, I'm sure. Yeah. And it's only like a nine and a half hour drive from Jersey, so not too bad. No, it's not at, not at all. Kentucky is pretty easy to get to. Yeah. I'll, I'll be out in uh, Magnolia, Kentucky next week. Okay. Yeah. For... A friend's getting married out there, actually, so. Yeah, cool. Nice. Uh, this is my first time visiting Kentucky. Yeah. Oh, good. I see cabin rentals. <laughs> That's what I need, a cabin. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, Water. <they> <laughs> Electricity, shower, bathroom. Yay. <laughs> that, that was the fun thing out at, uh, at the Dry Tortugas place. Is there, So there's no electric, no running water, no cell service. Uh, so there's no fresh water anywhere out there. You had to bring your own water and everything. You had to bring everything. Uh, so it was like true kind of... Um, uh, you know, remote camping, and uh, boy, it was fun. It was a blast. I really enjoyed it. It certainly keeps the crowds away. <laughs> uh, you hear me? Uh. Uh -huh. yeah. So now well, I'm going uh, 
campground Wi-Fi or are you on your phone Wi-Fi? No, I'm on my phone actually. Yeah. Okay, so it's pretty decent. I don't, I don't have Wi-Fi phone. here. Yeah, so I was praying that when I came here, there was going to be like a good cell signal at this campground. Because <laughs> if not, I was going to like drive around and find one. So that worked out well. And it was it was pretty cool. It was my first time ever doing a presentation like remotely like this. So it's kind of cool to see that it can work because um, I'm doing a lot more traveling. You know, like I said, I just got back from Alaska and then was in Florida. And I spent uh, the summer for a whole month up in Maine and New Hampshire running workshops up there. So. Uh, it's nice to be able to do these presentations from kind of anywhere I have a cell signal now, which is, which is neat. Good old technology. Yeah. Just proved our point that we can take our presentations out further and further. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm speaking to Las Vegas Photo Club tomorrow. <laughs> Very nice. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, thank you for your presentation. It was great. You're very welcome. And thank I you for having me. Thank the uh, Cranberry for the invitation to the other clubs. And uh, everyone have a safe winter and a good night. Thank you, Phil. Good thank night. Be me. safe. Be sure to come back again. We'll have other presentations. All right, guys, I think I'll say goodnight. Does that seem to be pretty much it? Yeah, it does. All righty. So thank, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Thank Ray. you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Yeah, you're very welcome. That was great. This is great. Even a scary picture. <laughs> <laughs> is that from like high school there, Valerie, or what? <laughs> what? The one that's up there now? Yeah. <laughs> that's a gorgeous picture, Valerie. No, that's... Yeah. That's my self-portrait after I cut my hair because everybody was giving me a hard time that my old port um, my old picture had my long hair. It's beautiful. I, I thought that was like your yearbook photo. Oh. Ray, are you sitting outside in a campfire there? What are you doing? Yes. I am. Yeah? Yep. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the fire is pretty much done. I mean, there's like there's like nothing left of the glow here. It's, like, it's just pretty sad right now. So I bet the stars oh. are amazing. Yeah, yeah, when I look, oh, well, I'm blind from the screen right now, but yeah, there's there's a lot of stars up there. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to say good night. All right, good night, take, take care. care. Right, Safe travels. Bye-bye. So All right, take care, right?